Why do reviewers insist on high-powered amplifiers? Oh, those doggone reviewers. <laughs> this question comes from Simon in München, Munich, Germany, where I met my wife, Terry. Okay, why is it that magazines and reviewers, when it comes to rather inefficient speakers, keep recommending amplifiers which seem way overpowered? An extreme example I stumbled across recently was a review of the KEF LS50 where the reviewer recommended an amplifier like the McIntosh MA72000 with a whopping 300 watts into 8 ohms. And that is a big amplifier. Um, he was not the only reviewer of the speaker who said the like. For sure, a decent 50 watt amplifier will do just fine if you turn the volume all the way up. So why do they say you need such a powerful amplifier? I'm pretty sure there's some reason behind this madness. <laughs> yeah, we're audio nuts. We're, we're, we're audiophiles. That, that's that's part of the madness, right? Okay, so I, we've been we've been through this before, and it has to do with with headroom, and big amplifiers are the bigger. If 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 you could design an amplifier to be any size you wanted without worrying about the sound quality. In other words, the, the design of a big amplifier is different than the design of a small amplifier. They aren't just necessarily scaled up. I mean, sometimes they are, but, but typically there's different design parameters that we'd, we'd want to use for one kind of amplifier, like a small amp or a big amp. So they will sound different. But imagine for a moment that they didn't sound different. Imagine that we went from small to super big and they had the same sound quality. Which would you choose? Well, I would always choose the bigger amplifier because headroom. You want to be able to operate within a small zone of linearity. So let's, let's, let's talk linearity and then I'll get back to the exact question. I, I'll, I'll try not to ramble too far. Every device, whether it be a tube or a transistor, and every piece of equipment that runs off of tubes and transistors has what we call a linear zone. There's, a, there's an area that is the greatest amount of linearity, and that's the zone that you want to operate in as much as you can. Now, imagine if you take a transistor, let's just take a typical transistor, and, and we turn it on and use it as an amplifier. It, the, the, the curve, and I apology, my apologies to, to Ohm's Law listeners, but the curve is going to look kind of like a, a sideway, uh, so, sort of like an angled S, where it kind of goes up, and this is nonlinearity, and then it flattens out to a, a, just a ramp of linear performance, and then it starts becoming nonlinear again. And that small area of linearity, maybe it's 20%, if we're lucky, 30%, says that 70%, everything left over, is non-linear, meaning what goes in does not come out. So a linear system, if I put something in, I get that exact analog of it out. Maybe it's bigger or I've done something to it, but what I put in, I get out. No distortion, it's linear. That happens in amplifiers as well. And amplifiers have a certain area a percentage, usually not that big, where you get linear performance. Now, we have tricks that we can linearize a circuit or an amplifier. We can use feedback that takes these nonlinear areas and adds a correction signal to it. But that isn't natively linear. So what you want for best sound is to stay within the linear regions of the amplifier or the device. And to do that, you need to have as big, as large a linear region as you can manage. And if, if we just use percentages, if 30% if, if of an amplifier is linear, then the bigger the amplifier, the larger the linear region, right? I mean, it only makes sense. And that's why headroom is so important. So I think what most reviewers are talking about is staying within that linear region and that's why they insist upon it. Now, some reviewers are just plain lazy. They don't want to try and 
match a, a, a little amplifier up to an inefficient speaker and hope for the best, it's just easier to put a big amp on and be done with it. There's no danger in doing that. It's in fact more dangerous to have an underpowered amp than an overpowered amp, as long as you don't you know, slam the gas pedal to the floor. All that said, my system at home, my wife's system, Terry, is a pair of these same speakers, the LS50. Now she drives that with Sprout to as loud as you want, and it's a good sounding system. That's only 100 watts. So it's not a big powerful amplifier. It's 100 watts and it works great. Would it sound better with a pair of BHK monoblocks? Oh, you bet. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. But it would be kind of a, almost a silly match in that you're putting you know, a huge amount of resources into something that, yes, will benefit, but if you're gonna do that, you might as well upgrade the speakers as well. I've actually tried to convince Terry. I said, we, we own an audio company. Let's, you know, let, let, let's take some cool shit home, you know? Nope, nope, I like my Sprout and I like my LS50s. And you leave it alone, because that's what I want. And God bless her. <laughs> All right, thank you. I'll talk to you later.